Carl Henrik Svanberg, you're closely associated with big businesses with a global outlook, BP, Volvo, Ericsson. How important is it for today's skilled professionals to have a truly international perspective? Well, I think it's actually very, very important because if you think about it, the companies back in, the, the big companies we know of today, 1990, they were maybe a tenth of the size. Through globalization, these companies have become very, very big. And we have gone from a time when we used to send out our, our expats into exotic places because we needed to know that we had people we could trust to actually send out people or bring people home to actually educate them on different cultures, be part of the world and see and don't think that you have the answers, but have an interest to truly learn from the areas where we work. And how easy is it to get the best out of multinational workforces coming from vastly different environments and backgrounds? Well, first of all, I think it's important to understand that we're all just human beings. And whether in some, 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 uh, in some countries people have a culture of being more optimistic, other countries have a country of being more pessimistic or they express themselves verbally more or less. These are all sort of like, a, almost like a dress, uh, the, the clothing. At the end of it, we're all people. And I think it's so important that you manage to gather people uh, around the vision, an idea. What is it that we try to accomplish? Uh, there is this old story about a cartoon when you see in the background you can see that people are obviously building a temple and in the foreground you see that two people are sitting cutting stones and you ask the first one, what are you doing? He says, am I cutting a stone? And you ask the other guy, he says, what are you doing? We're building a temple. And I think it's so important for people in today's world when you compete for, for the best that you give them a, a chance to understand what it's all for. You were able to transition as chairman of BP into a very different commercial environment. At Ericsson, you were the first CEO in 60 years to yeah. come from outside the company. Yeah. How important is flexibility, do you think, for today's young graduates looking at the mobile telecommunications industries, the uh, energy industries? Well, there are different aspects of this. It's, it's a bit of personality also. I was, I was fortunate in my early career to reach high positions and leadership positions. And when you have them, you can only go on for so long. And, and then you, you need to do something else. So that actually, I think, was the reason why I moved on to other industries. But there are similarities. I mean, there, the large corporations, it's, it's all about people. It's, it's all about motivating and organizing and understanding people from around the world. That's one side of it. But on the other hand, any industry, you have to know about the business. You, you, the devil is in the details, as we say. So, so when you come, even if you come in as a CEO, you know you're back to, the, to, to, to your studying. You have to understand and, and so that you can not think that there is a one-size-fits-all solutions to every problem you find. So it is a bit of a challenge to also change. But I would say, though, that in large corporations, you don't have to move from a company to another to have an exciting life. You can spend a life in a company and get lots of exciting things to do. Many leading global companies are complaining about a skills shortage, particularly in fields like engineering, for yeah. example. Do you think that enough is being done in terms of initiatives between national governments, industry, and academia to meet that requirement? Well, because we, we employ so much people, our success is how we can find the best and get the best out of the ones we find. And, and of course, if you are in a, in a technology business or an engineering business, you have to have graduates from that field. You depend on it. And, and there, is a, there is an increased challenge. I, I think it comes from the fact that, think about developing countries like China and India. These people, they're building a country. They're building new airports, they're building high-speed trains, they, they're bringing television out in the rural areas. They, they do a lot of things that actually people every day see how the country is, is developing. In our countries, in, in our, our more mature markets, life is very similar like it was 10 years ago. And it's not that obvious. And, and I think that's one reason why it's been not as attractive anymore. We are, I think, here 15, 17 percent in in the UK that study STEM subjects, where it's almost 50% in China. And this is an increasing challenge. 
I'd like to focus a little bit on your own personal experience yeah. and your career path as such. A lot of people assume that uh, success in global business means ruthlessness. You've acquired a nickname as Gentle Conqueror. Uh, <laughs> I wonder how you've been able to favor persuasion over imposition. Well, I, I think you, it, it's, it, it, the ruthlessness is really, I think, is, is more of a name when you push through things without really explaining it. People are very, they understand the rationale. And if you think about a company like Ericsson, it completely transforms itself year over year over year. And you have to drive change every day. And I think it's so important to get people along on the travel, on the journey. What is it that you're trying to reach? And what is the circumstances under which you, you operate? And what changes do you have to drive? If you can create a feeling that it's always change in the world around you, so you have to change. People get nervous if they do not change because they know if we stand still, we're going to lose. If you have an organization that is not used to change, they get nervous when you start to do so. So I think it's so important to get everybody on board and then you can drive hard the changes, but you don't have to be ruthless because you, people understand. Some close observers attribute a large part of your success to being able to get the maximum effect out of team members working towards a common goal. But I wonder, how do you manage to balance that with the burning ambitions of a talented individual? Well, I think most, most people are, are, are quite human in a way. I mean, they, I actually think that the world has more, when you look at it from, from the top of an organization, you have more holes to fill than you seem to have talented people. When you're sitting there on the, on the, at the bottom and looking up, you say, how will I ever get a job? I need to elbow myself. I need to get to the right position and push myself through. You just need to do a good job. And I, I think nothing is more fun than to be part of a successful company, to part, be part of a team, work together and accomplish big things. And your time will come if you do a good job and you will get the jobs you desire that you want to have. Well, that's very much the voice of experience. But uh, after four decades in business, how do you identify yourself? Do you see yourself as a business leader? You've, after all, reached the very top. You, you know, that's, that's an interesting question because I grew up in the very north of Sweden. I grew up north of the Arctic Circle. My father was in, in the Swedish state power board building hydropower stations up there, and he was a, his a, a economic assistant. But we, I was there and I saw these, these mines, I saw these, these dams, I saw these hydropower stations grow. So I always wanted to be an engineer. And it's, it's, it's actually just a fun thing. When I, today, if I, if I immigrate into a country and you have to fill in the forms and they, and, and they ask for your profession, I always write engineer because I feel that's, that's who I am. I, I don't want to say anything else, but that's an engineer. That's, that's what I am. And why did you decide to become an engineer? What was your source of inspiration? Well, I, I don't know. I, I think it was actually that I like complex things. I, I like math and science in, in school. Uh, I've always done that. And I, I, uh, but it was also the fact that if you become, you can become a lawyer and you're a lawyer for life. I'm sure they would describe it differently, I, 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 just my view at it. Or you become a doctor or whatever, you, be, you become something. But an engineer, in most people's minds, is someone sitting with a calculator and thinking and calculating and making drawings and things. But the fact is that no education is as broad as an engineering education is. You get everything from, from, from organization to economics to engineering. and. Actually, when you go to university to become an engineer, I think about 90% before the career has ended up in leadership positions throughout companies, dealing with sales or organization or production or, of course, research and development or political contacts or whatever. But, but most of them are not, not, not sort of uh, still in the real true engineering role. The world of business seems very different from the core function of an engineer. 
What drove you to add those business skills, those commercial skills to your armory of physics and engineering skills? Wasn't it uh, tempting to indulge that primary passion? Well, I, in that primary passion was also uh, I love to work with people. And, and as a matter of fact, before I, I started my education to become an engineer, I considered to become a high school teacher in math and science. That was, that was actually one thing that I had as an alternative. And, I, and, and then I ended up feeling that as an engineer, I could probably go there too that way. But it was my drive to work with people. I've never been a loner. I'm, I'm not the person that would try to conquer Mount Everest on my own. I would much rather be on a... On a, in a crew sailing around uh, in a sail race or something, be part of something to create something. So I think it was my people interest that drove me to business. Tell me a little bit about your decision to move from Ericsson to BP. Well, it, it was a, it, it can seem as a, as a bit of a long shot because, because Ericsson seems like a very fast moving, it's really incredibly changing. Every year everything is changing. Five years later, nothing in your cell you sold five years ago. And it's a lot of, it's an R&D machine. And, and of course, this is a traditional and BP traditional uh, business that does much the same. So in that sense, it's very, very different. But the fact is that oil and gas is like the blood system of this world. It's high on political, uh, politicians' agendas. You invest big time to billions of dollars to have the right to, dr to go and drill and see if you find something and explore for 20 years and produce the payback. Telecoms is like the nervous system. It's very similar. It's also high on politicians' agenda. It's also very political, very regulated. And you pay billions for the right to use a frequency and build broadband. So if you come to emerging markets, you find that companies that are involved in energy are very often also involved in in telecom. So the step was not as, as, as far as some think, but it, it was time for me to move on. So essentially you've got big companies, big projects, big ambitions, big emerging markets. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, if you think about it, uh, before, before, uh, before we leave this planet, we, we, uh, two, uh, three quarters of this world would be the, the, the emerging markets and their economic growth. So that is where the action is. It's not so much actions in in our countries anymore. I've heard you say many times that big companies must give back something to society, essentially yeah. to be a force for good, yeah. to give back in social, financial, environmental terms. Yeah. Doesn't that also make very good business though? It always does, it always does. But it's very, it's very obvious when you work in a country uh, and, and especially if you work in emerging markets. In my previous experience when we were in Africa, for example, there wasn't a single deal that we did there without the, the buyer saying, but tell me first, what, what are you doing for Africa? And we went into it, we educated the young students in math or in eco economy. It's the same thing in BP, we do a lot of that. And I must say, the risk when, when companies go multinational or very global is that they, they forget their belonging and therefore don't really see the need to pay back to, because who should they pay back to? They can't pay back to the whole world. And, and, and I think BP is a good exception there. BP is exceptionally good in, in investing into to, uh, helping to attract young students into to STEM subject, to, to uh, work with, with uh, universities and projects that are important to us. BP is good in that, actually. I'm, 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 I'm quite impressed. You've also often stressed the importance of strategic leadership for companies with yes. global aspirations and a global outlook. Yeah. Why is that so important? Well, the fact is that the world will, with, with, will continuously change. So, so whatever direction that, that seems the logical one today is not going to win forever. And, and we, we used to use, in, in, in my previous job, we used to use an expression that Today's victories create, uh, create inspiration, but they sell them solutions to tomorrow's problems. And I think you have to continuously around, look around the corner and look for the new challenges and look for where, where you need to, to bring the company to stay ahead and to, to defend and develop your position. Carl Henrik Svanberg, thank you very much indeed. Thanks a lot.